it's a special Sunday today, and uh, I get the opportunity to uh, welcome again uh, Pastor Greg and Connie are with us. Who, if you're new today, yeah. If you're uh, if you're new today, Pastor Greg was lead pastor for 12 years uh, up until just about a year and a half ago, and served. Uh, him and Connie in that capacity. And so I'm just so grateful for their leadership and uh, all of their uh, prayers and love and investment and still continue to pray for us. And so just grateful for them. And uh, I don't, he's going to share an update on what, what they've been up to. So would you, uh, one more time, I know you just sat down, but one more time, would you stand with me and let's honor Pastor Greg as he comes to share the word of God. Well, good morning, Radiant Church. It's good to see you this morning. Surprise Campus Online. I want to say good morning to El Mirage, Sun City, and uh, Deer Valley as well this morning, and Pastor Caden, uh, Hope, and uh, Nash now. And I just want to say thank you for, man, just thank you for saying yes. I mean, I when I met with Pastor Caden, it was uh, really the first time was uh, up at... Uh, was over at that Starbucks, right? I think we just sat down, and it was like, uh, and we were talking, and I just immediately saw an anointing upon his life. And as we journeyed together, and he said yes to come on the team at Radiant, I watched this anointing, and God spoke to me years before uh, we made this transition, and, he said, and God said, hey, Pastor Caden's the next guy. And then when I saw a Hope come in, she, there's an anointing on Hope, and, and it was so comforting to watch God putting things in place. So listen, what I'm hearing what I'm seeing, how, I, how we're feeling in this place today. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for saying yes. We believe in you. You're anointed. Great things are going to happen through you in a powerful way. So I love you, man. Thanks for being my friend. And hey, listen, some of you guys have been asking a little bit about what is happening at Convoy Hope. So I got a picture. Uh, maybe it's adequate not, but we just moved into our brand new building. So we've got two buildings. Uh, it's 450,000 square feet over 224 acres. And uh, we have about uh, 500 plus employees internationally and locally. We're on goal for God's goal in 2030 to feed 1 million kids on a daily basis. Uh, praise the Lord. And uh, so we're going to be moving right around 600,000 kids by the end of the year all across the globe in about 40 plus different countries. And then we're going to be looking in 2030 to be empowering 250,000 women kids and boys and girls on a daily basis, training 125,000 farmers on a daily basis. And uh, so God's really moving in an amazing way. Uh, people ask about the Middle East. We have responded in the lifetime of Convoy Hope over 700 disaster responses in the lifetime. This year, almost 80 alone, and we're not through the end of the year. And we're in the Middle East, we're in Syria, Turkey still, we're practicing still in Ukraine. Uh, we're down in Florida and the Mississippi Valley responding to tornadoes and hurricanes. And, uh, but the Lord has been faithful. And I want to thank you for your generosity. Thank you for praying. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for the disaster buckets. When I got there about a year and a half ago, I walked out in the warehouse and I saw Radiant Church disaster buckets. And now they're gone. They're being used for God's glory. People go, are you preaching a convoy? I say, I'm not preaching a convoy. Listen, I have, I've been on a plane 50 times in the first 65 weeks I was there, and I've been overseas to Africa four times, and then been to Slovakia, and, and uh, now if I'm not traveling, I'm into seven to 11 meetings every day, so it's always uh, great, come over here, get out of there, we need you here. So it's been really good, and the Lord's been faithful. It's an end-time kind of ministry, so thanks again for uh, allowing us and releasing us to go. And uh, we, just, uh, we just are so grateful uh, for what uh, you guys are doing for the kingdom of God uh, through the ministry of Radiant Church and Convoy Hope. People ask me about my family. Here's the family picture. Uh, obviously, this is uh, down in Branson. We just had a picture there. Connie, you know Connie over on the front row. She's the love of my life. And we've been married 40 years now. She's put up with me for 40 years. And uh, she's keeping us on the straight and narrow. She's uh, uh, praying for us and pointing us in the right direction and taking care of our daughter, our granddaughter, Evelyn, Evie. Evie is going to be five years old in uh, January, and she'll be going to kindergarten in the fall full-time, believe it or not. She is, uh, yeah, she's a candle. She's, uh, she's amazing. And then you'll see Jill. 
Uh, Pastor Jill was here on staff. Jill uh, spent some time at Convoy. She spent some time at James River Assembly, and now she started her own business called Becoming Resources. You should look it up. And if you want somebody to speak for you, write for you, uh, or coach you, then she's the right one to call. And uh, she's super talented and gifted and doing great, great work. She's written her first book. We're getting ready to publish it. She's into her second book, and is very, very talented. And then you'll see uh, Aaron over here. Aaron has moved from physical therapy to Convoy Hope. He's out in the disaster service. In his first week, on a Wednesday, he was down in Florida with a hurricane. He's anointed to help the work there too as well. So that's a little bit of an update. I'm tired of updates. Don't want to catch up. Some of you go, I don't even know who you are. Let's go. Let's get ready today. I love the word of God. Want to preach the word of God. God told me somebody's going to get saved today. Online, here in person, I don't know where you're sitting, don't know your name, but God knows your name. You're going to get changed today. The old is going to become new. The dead's going to come back to life. Your name's going to be written in the Lamb's book of life. Today's going to be your spiritual birthday. Somebody's going to get saved. Do you believe that today with me? Yeah. We'll stop just for a moment and pray that happens. God, I thank you for today. Thank you for this moment that you saw in eternity past. I thank you for every person here today, and I pray you'll breathe on your word. May it come to life. Breathe on your servant. May it come to life. Breathe on your people's heart. May it come to life. May your word that never comes back empty or void has the power to change and save a person, change and save people. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Well, the title of my message today is Stretch Your Faith. Stretch your faith. Why do we need to stretch our faith? It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how long you've been a Christian. If you're not a Christian yet, we are going to need to stretch our faith. Why? Because in Hebrews, the writer says this in uh, chapter 11, verse 6. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can't be in relationship with God unless you have faith. And God wants to do great things to all of us. We, get, we need to mature in our faith. Our faith can increase. We need to have faith. Without faith, it's impossible not only to be in relationship with God, but we need to be stressed to do all God wants us to do. And some of you are going, I want, what is faith? And I'm good, good question. I'm glad you asked that question. Verse one tells us faith is this. To have faith is to be sure of things we hope for and certain of the things we cannot see. To be sure and to be certain. You know, the world says uh, this, I need to be able to see it, then I'll believe it, right? But a Christian says, I don't need to do that. I need to believe it, and then God will let me see it. You've heard it said before that God's, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it, right? Does that sound like your faith? Is your faith sure and certain this morning? Is it okay if you believe it and then you see it this morning? Because I know everybody in here in Washington today, God wants to stretch your faith. Don't you see it this morning? Don't you perceive it? God wants to do something new in your life today. He wants to make a way in your wilderness. He wants to put streams in your desert. You don't have to go back very far in the Bible to see that God, he put Moses in a basket to put him in a palace. God put David in front of Goliath to make him a king. God has put you here today uniquely and specially to do great and wonderful things for him. And as I say that, I know for sure somebody here and somebody watching is going, well, Pastor Greg, that's not me. My past has defined me. Too many mistakes, too many regrets, too much failure. I have no value to God. Can I tell you today with 100% certainty that is a wrong statement? You are valuable to God. Let me show you something. Got a $20 bill. Who wants a $20 bill on the front row? Anybody? Okay. Okay, but not yet, not yet, not yet, okay? So what if I took this $20 bill and I wadded it up? You still want it? What if I dropped it on the ground? You still want it? What if I kicked it? You still want it? What if I step on it? You still want it? What if I turn my back on it? You still want it? Here's your $20 bill. Come get your $20 bill. You came to church and I'm giving you money. Look at that, and that's something new. That's a demonstration of God. Listen, some of you that say you're not valuable, some of you could have been, feel like you're wadded up, dropped to the ground, stepped on, kicked around, had your back turned on, and you still have value to God. God's calling you his masterpiece, his workmanship. He has great and wonderful things for you. Your mess can still be your message. Your testers you're walking through can still be a testimony. The pain you have today has a purpose. Listen, your story can still bring him glory. 
It's important to all of us get reset today and make sure we know we have value and you're willing to stretch your faith. Why? Because the world, for the, I'm telling you, I'm just, I feel ancient up here, right? I feel old, but I'm telling you, in this lifetime that I've lived, the world needs to see the church's faith greater than ever before. I mean, from Radiant Church serving here and now Convoy Hope, this is an end times kind of stuff. If it's not the end times, it's birth pains. I mean, you got wars and rumors of wars. You got famine, earthquake, natural disasters. And the world needs to see someone step up and say, I have faith in Jesus. The world needs to see it like never before. That's why it is important for us to stretch our faith. So let's just stretch our faith for a few minutes here. Let me ask a couple of questions. How many people believe in miracles? Raise your hand. All right now, put your hand down. Different question. How many people believe miracles are for today? Raise your hand. Almost everybody. Right? How many people before the Lord, not before me, would say, I need a miracle today? Raise your hand. That's a lot of people today. That's why we need to stretch our faith. Miracles are for today. John chapter 20 says, God, you can't even write all the miracles down, Jesus did, John chapter 20 says, but they write them down. Why? So people will come to faith for the first time and people go deeper in their faith. If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, why wouldn't miracles be for? Today, today, get ready. Today's your day to have a miracle. Listen, I want to take you to a story in the Bible. It's in 2 Kings. You got a Bible, open it up. You got an app, open it up. If you're going through the Bible and you go to first in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. If you get to 1 Chronicles, you've gone too far, take a U-turn, come back to 2 Kings. The story's in 2 Kings, chapter four, so we're going to pick it up. This is a story that involves the prophet Elisha. It involves a dad. A mom, a son, a tragedy, and a miracle. And I want you to see three things, and I hope you're taking notes today. Three things this woman, this mom did to see her miracle. Let's watch this lady start with this amount of faith and watch her stretch her faith throughout this short story. Number one, she did three things to see her miracle. Number one, she prepared, write the word down, prepare. We need to prepare for our miracle. Let's pick it up, chapter four, second Kings, verse eight. One day, Elisha went to Shunem and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there. Now, Elisha had a mentor named Elijah, so let's not get confused, okay? And so Elijah and Elisha, they're walking and the Lord then at that time separates Elijah and Elisha with a chariot of fire and a whirlwind takes up Elijah to heaven. So Elijah never really died on the earth. And that's why we've gone through this in Revelation. That's why many think Elijah and never saw Moses die either, that Moses and Elijah could be the two uh, witnesses you see in Revelation, perhaps, okay? So then you see this miracle of this boy that's gonna be raised from the dead today. It's the second miracle of being raised from the dead in the Bible. The first one is found in 1 Kings where Elijah raised a boy from the dead for a widow. This is the second resurrection or the raising of the dead that you'll find in the Bible. And the third one, interestingly enough, is in chapter 13 of 2 Kings where there was a war going on, a raid, and a man died. There's not enough time to bury the man, so they threw him in the tomb of Elijah. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, all of a sudden he came to life again. So there's three times in the Old Testament that people were raised from the dead, seven times in the New Testament, climaxing with Jesus and all about Jesus in the New Testament. Shunem, uh, for those of you that are in Israel or we're going to go and we'll go to Israel someday, uh, is, uh, that is in the, the area of Galilee. So you have Israel, you have the three areas we've divided up before, which is Judea, that's Jerusalem. Samaria, and Galilee. So Shunem would be a village, a little village, just south of Galilee. It's going to be east of Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel comes into play in just a minute. So Elisha, he goes to Shunem, meets this well-to-do woman, verse 10. Let's make. Everybody say, let's make. Louder. Let's make. Okay, that's important. Let's make a small room, the lady tells the husband. On the roof of our house, and put a bed in and a table, a chair and a lamp for Elisha, and then when Elisha comes here, he can stay with us. What's the woman doing here? The woman is making room for her miracle. The woman is preparing for her miracle. Even though she hasn't spoken it, we're going to see in a minute, she needs a miracle. 
And she's making room and preparing for that miracle to come into her home. The question I have for you today, are you preparing for a miracle? Are you making room for a miracle in your life? Are you telling the Lord, I believe in miracles. I believe miracles are for today. I need you to do a miracle. And I believe you'll do it in your timing, in your way. Are you preparing for your miracle? And then all of a sudden, Elijah is grateful for the kindness of the woman. He says, I want to repay her. So he says, what can I do to repay you? Can I speak highly of you with the officials in the area? And the well-do woman says, no, I'm good. I'm fine. I I really don't need anything. And then uh, Elisha goes, I don't think she's telling the truth. And so he turned around and asked his his servant Gehazi, verse 14. So Elisha says to Gehazi, what can be done for her? And Gehazi says she has no son and her husband is old. The miracle she needs, Elisha, God, is she needs to have a son, but her husband can't give her a son. What I like about this verse is that Gehazi is calling her out, right? He's going, listen, you're not telling the truth. I'm going to call you out right now on it, right? If you don't come clean, I'll have to tell Elisha. And so I wonder when I watch the prayer partners down here doing their ministry this morning, how many of you, when you were invited to come down, said, no, I'm good, I'm fine. How many people, when you walked in today, people go, how you doing? I'm good, I'm fine, you're really not. How many times when you're in a serve group or a life group and they say, how can I pray for you? I'm good. I'm fine. Aren't you grateful for a spouse or for a friend that elbows you in the ribs and said, you better come clean, (laughs) right? You're not fine and you're not good and you should be going down front to get prayed for. Because here's why. Even though God, you say, well, God knows. Yeah, God does know. But God's waiting for you and for me to verbalize our dependence on him and say, God, I need you to show up. God, I need a miracle in my life. Some of us need to go, I don't know really what to do next in this season of life. God, I need your wisdom, and God will give you wisdom. Some of you are going to go home today after the service and look at your kitchen table and go, I can't pay the bills. God, I need you to help pay the bills, and God help you pay the bills. Some of you today are going, I really want the kind of faith we're getting ready to talk about. Increase my faith, and God will absolutely increase your faith. Because we serve a God that's personal enough to know every detail of your life. I've said it before, I'll say it again. He knows the hairs on your head and the lack of hairs on my head, right? But he's also powerful enough to do absolutely everything we need in our life. Got to be honest, got to tell the truth. Got to say, here's what I need, verse 15. Then Elisha said, call her. And so he called her and she stood in the doorway. I stopped with that for a minute because as I'm speaking here, some of you are standing in the doorway of your faith. Some of you are standing in the doorway of your miracle, half in, half out. God, I really want a miracle, but I'm not sure you care. God, I really need you to show up, but I don't know if you will. God, I see you doing miracles in other people's life, but I really wonder if that miracle is for me. Some of you are standing halfway in, and halfway out at the doorway of your faith and miracle. And God is telling you today to break through that doorway and walk into the throne of grace boldly and get the help and the time that you need to have it. Why am I confident in that? The word of God. You're in in a house right now that prays. You're in a house where Pastor Caden rightly divides the word. You're in a house filled with God's presence. You're in a house that believes in miracles. You're in the right place at the right time. Life is lived at the deep end of the pool. You can't wait into your faith. You got to jump in both feet. Listen, move from the doorway of your faith and miracle into the throne of grace. Find the help when you need it. So she needs this son. And Elisha says, okay, you're going to be pregnant. And this time next year, you're going to have a baby. And she, her response is, don't mislead your servant, please. Well, that's being in the doorway of the faith. I want it, but I'm not sure you'll do it. And then look what happens in verse 17. But the woman became pregnant, and next year she gave birth to the son, just as Elijah had told her. She received her miracle. God wants us today to see. You might be standing in the doorway of your faith, but if you'll step through in the throne room, you can find and see the miracle that you want in your heart and you desire, right? And let me say this to you. I know Pastor Caden was 
give me some stories about the church, which I really, really love all the time. Thank you, Pastor. And he says, man, people are filling out praise reports coming down and telling us about praise reports. Keep doing that. Fill out your praise reports. Give those to Pastor Caden and the church because it's powerful to see people receive a miracle, isn't it? It encourages their faith. If you can do it for them, God, you can do it for me. So prepare for your miracle. Number two, she shut the door. She played, she prepared, she made room for a miracle to happen even though she was in the doorway of her faith and now she shuts the door. Here's what happens, this is her miracle. The little boy grows up. He's out in the field with his father. His father's a farmer. His father has servant, servants out there and they're, they're reaping the field, the harvest and the boy gets a head injury. The boy goes to his dad and says, my head, my head. And the dad says, carry my boy, carry my miracle to his mother. And so the servants carry the boy to the mom in the house, and the mom sits there and holds the boy, holds her miracle until her boy and her miracle dies. Miracles died. But that's not the end of the story. Aren't you grateful? Verse 21. She, the well-to-do woman mom, went up and laid him, the boy who died, on the bed of the man of God, Elijah's room, and she shut the door and she went out. And what we're seeing here, we're seeing a woman that has a different kind of faith. Her faith is being stretched. The first part, she's in the doorway, halfway in, halfway out. And now all of a sudden, this represents her taking her miracle that died and said, oh no, that's not the end of the story. I'm walking through the doorway into the room, room of grace and laying the, my boy, my miracle down at the feet of God, represented at the feet of God. I believe this story's not over yet. And she shut the door. Sometimes we have to shut the doors in our life. Sometimes we have to shut the doors to people around us that are negative. Amen. Shut the doors to people in our life that don't believe in miracles or for today. Sometimes we need to shut the doors to people in our life that tear us down instead of build us up. We need to shrink our circle to only people that have faith and tune out the rest, you can see that. Jesus did that in Mark chapter five. He was gonna heal a little girl and the people were negative. People going, I don't believe. And he shut the door to them, went up and the little girl survived. Shut the door to people around you because if you don't, they'll tear you down and cause you to be in the doorway the rest of your life. You gotta shut them out, tune them out, shrink your circle to people that believe in the word of God, believe miracles are for today, will pray with you, walk with you, let me say this to you, the $20 bill. Let me go back to that for a minute. Some of you need to shut the door to the lies of the enemy. The enemy just wants to kill, steal, and destroy our faith. Shut the door to what he says. How do you know if it's the enemy? Because it's not in the word of God. You can't, you won't, it's too late, it's over. I never read any of that in the Bible. That's the devil trying to steal your joy. Shut the door on what the devil, devil get behind me. You have no foothold in my life. I'm shrinking my circle to the things of God. And I think it's important for me just to, before I move on from this point, parents, grandparents, foster parents, get in your teenager's business. You need to shut the door to people they're running with. You need to shrink the circle of who they're running with. Well, Pastor Greg, how do do that? Take their phone away. Don't let them talk to those people. Oh. Don't put gas in their car so they can get there and talk to the people. Oh. Don't give them any money allowance to get to see those people. Well, they're just gonna yell at me and call me names. I'm saying, yeah, they will, because my kid did that too. My son did that too. But I'm not gonna resource his bad decisions. You in love, tell them, listen, I love you. This is the way I'm showing you I love you. I believe in your greatness. I believe there's a call of God on your life, and I'm gonna shrink your circle, get in your business, because I want you to be all God has designed you to be. <laughs> love them, show them. And what you're doing is Proverbs 22, 6. You're training a child up in the way they should go so they ultimately won't depart from their ways. You know, I didn't talk about my son in that picture. My son, Jamie, if you know the backstory, some of you asked this morning, thank you for praying for him. This time next year, he'll be out. He's married to a beautiful young lady named Alexis. And I will tell you this, I have never seen my son, Jamie, and Alexis be more on fire for the Lord than they are right now. He's gonna come out and do great things, and we believe in that. And Jamie's told me if I ever get a chance to speak, to tell parents and grandparents and foster parents, get in the business, shut the door, shrink the circle, 
they'll come back to the Lord. So prepare, shut the door. Number three, last thing is take hold. It's time to take hold. Here's what the woman does. The woman then says, okay, uh, husband, give me, some, give me a donkey. I'm going to see the man of God, Elisha, in Mount Carmel. This goes to verse 25. So she set out. The woman set out. He came to the man of God, Elisha, at Mount Carmel, about 15 miles away. She gets on a donkey, rides 15 miles. And when he saw her in the distance, I got that in yellow for a moment, the man of God said to the servant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite. God said, Greg, when you read this, stop for a minute and tell people, you may feel distant from God, but he's not distant from you. He sticks closer than a brother. He's walking up and down the aisles of your life right now. He's making a way when there's no way. He's making your way straight. Some of you that are distant from God and don't have him as Savior, you're going to get saved in a minute, and he's going to be right here. He's going to carry you if he has to. Verse 26. So Elisha tells Gehazi, his servant, run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Check this out. This can be really confusing if you don't understand it. Everything is all right, she said. How in the world could she say everything's all right when her son has died? We're watching her faith being stretched. She's in the doorway. Then she walks into the throne of grace and shuts the door. And now her faith has gone to an all-time new level being stretched. She is not preparing for a funeral. She's preparing for a resurrection. This is a reminder to you today that God still brings dead things back to life. He can bring dead marriages back to life, dead relationships back to life, dead businesses back to life. God is still in the business of rolling stones away, opening doors, making new ways. It just takes the, the seed of a faith to move a mountain that's in your way. God is reminding us today that he can do more than we can ever think or imagine. God is telling us today that he is the God that does the impossible. She's preparing for a resurrection, not a funeral. Verse 27. So she reached the man of God at the mount and she took hold of his feet. So the woman has prepared, made room. Her faith is stretched to walk in the throne room boldly. And now she's taking hold of her miracle and she's not gonna let go until that little boy of hers, that miracle of her comes back to, to life. So what happens is Elisha tells Gehazi, here's my staff, run back 15 miles. That's where the marathon started back in the Old Testament. Run 15 miles, right? And if somebody tries to talk to you, don't talk to the left, don't talk to the right, and put the staff on the little boy. Now, Elisha assumes the woman's going to go with Gehazi, and she says, I'm holding on. I will not go until you go. And so Elisha says, okay, we'll go. So Elisha and the mom are following. Gehazi gets to the house, puts the staff on the boy. Nothing happens. He comes back. He meets Elisha and the woman almost near her home and said, listen, I put the staff on the boy. Nothing has happened. So Elisha, what he does is he, at that time, he goes into the room, shuts the door, the little boy on the bed, and begins to pray. Verse 34. Elisha got on the bed, lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands, stretched his faith out over the little boy, and the boy's body grew warm. You know, sometimes miracles are in an instant, and sometimes they're gradual. Right, some, this, today this may be your day for your miracle and it may be on the way home today, it may be tonight, it may be tomorrow morning. It's not a no, it's just not a yet. You need to expect your miracle. Verse 35, so Elijah turned away. He walked back and forth in the room. You know, sometimes, and I've done this and Connie's done this and I know some of you have, sometimes you gotta walk the floor of your faith. Sometimes you just gotta shut the door and say, God, I know you're real. God, I know you're there. God, I know that you hear me. God, I know that you're a God of miracles. I know that you're able. I know that you can. I know that you will. I know you are good. I know you are faithful. I know you're gonna be more than capable. And oh God, I believe you are gonna show up and change my situation. Sometimes you need to walk the floor of your faith. Don't let go of your miracle until you see it. Continue in verse 35. After he walks the floor of faith, after he's praying that way, he gets on the bed, stretches out his faith once more on the little boy, and now the boy sneezed several times and opened his eyes. And God, by no accident today, is showing you a miracle to encourage you for the miracle that you raised your hand for a few minutes ago. 
in verse 36 and 37. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. And he did. And when she came in, he says, take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, bowed to the ground, and then she took her son and went out. That is the posture of worship. When you get your miracle, only God did it. I didn't do it. Pastor Caden didn't do it. No man, no person could do it. Only God can change the situation. And God gets all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And we bow down in worship, in a posture of worship, saying, oh God, thank you. So she did three things to see her miracle. She prepared and made room. God, I believe miracles are for today. I don't know how you're going to do it. I'm kind of believing it, and I'm kind of not, but I hope it happens. She then decides to shut the door to herself, her past, her naysayers, and walk right boldly in the throne room of grace, shut the door, it shrinks her circle to only people that believe. And she takes hold of her miracle and will not let go until she sees it. Those are the three things the woman did today. So I'll come now and ask you the question I started with. Are you ready to stretch your faith today? Sometimes you got to stretch. Pastor Caden and Hope, they stretch their faith over this church and over you every week. They pray for you, your family, your situation, what you're walking through. Stretching is hard. Stretching is work. Stretching can make you sore, but it's how we build our spiritual muscles. Are you ready to stretch your faith today over your marriage, over your home, over your kids, over your business, over your health, over that addiction that can't be broken, over this neighborhood, over this community, over this city? You know, Jesus stretched his faith on the cross and says, this is how much I love you. Every morning I get up and part of my prayers is, Jesus, thank you for not letting the cup pass. He's in the garden of Gethsemane going, God, if you can save humanity any other way, I'm all in. God says, no, and then Jesus says, your will, not, your will be done, not mine. Jesus gets on the cross for you and me and spreads his arms out and says, I'm going to stretch out my faith over people that are going to come to faith in the future because I trust God's going to bring me back to life, right? So today, God's asking you the same question. Will you trust him like Jesus did? Will you stretch your faith and say, God, I believe in miracles are for today? I'm going to ask the worship team if they'll come out and get in place. And I've been praying for the last 30 days that God would give words of knowledge. And I know Pastor Caden's taught on that, but 1 Corinthians 12, 8, words of knowledge. It's, it's words of truth that God wants to speak to someone or a group of people, but, but it's dependent upon the person or group of people receiving it in faith and go, that's me. I acknowledge that word is for me. So I'm going to ask today online, if that's you, you can raise your hand. Here in person, it's a surprise, you can raise your hand. But I believe today that there are someone here, in fact, I know there's more than one person here that is walking through stomach problems, digestive issues, what you eat hurts, you can't take it in, you can't take it out. It could be an allergy, it could be a bacteria, but there's somebody here that's struggling with digestion and stomach today, if that's you, raise your hand. Okay, Jan, back in. We've got two more for first service. I believe somebody here has been diagnosed with cancer and is very, very concerned and should be. Today, God wants to heal someone of cancer. He made the body. He can heal the body. How many people would raise their hand today? Remember, you're stretching your faith. Probably should have come down front. God's waiting for you to say, I need you. How many people today would say, I have cancer. I need God to heal my cancer. Raise your hand. The last word is this, it's a word of, of joints, and specifically it would be a hip or a knee. And I asked God if it was old or young, he says, it doesn't matter, I can do both. And so it doesn't matter if you've got a cane or a walker or if you're someone that maybe has arthritis or something like that. I don't know the cause of it, but I know that there's, it's pain to walk. It could be a hip or knee. And God wants to right now knit it all back together and make it well. If that's you today, you need a healing hip or knee area, hands going up. If you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to stand right where you're at. At home, if you raise your hand, I need you to stand. This is how you stretch your faith. This is how you tell God, I'm getting out of the doorway of my faith. I'm standing boldly in the throne room, and I'm going to hold on till I say my miracle. 
If you raise your hand, you didn't stand up. Don't go home going, I wish I would have. If you raise your hand, stand up all across this place. And I'm going to ask those around you, would you stand with them? Put your hand on them appropriately. Would you pray over them right now? And the worship team's going to sing a song for a couple of minutes. If you're at home, somebody in the room praying over you. If not, if you can't reach somebody, stretch your faith out with your hand. Stretch your faith out to the people at home. And we're going to sing for a couple of minutes. I'll come back in prayer. Lord, right now I pray in the powerful name of Jesus that you'll come against any digestive issues, stomach issues, bacteria, complications. God, I pray in the name of Jesus you heal people right now. The power of the blood of Jesus. God, I pray for everybody here that raised their hand to cancer. That feels like it's a doomsday. God, you're a new beginning. You're a stone rolled away. God, you're the one that brings the dead back to life. I pray you'll touch that body, heal that body of cancer, astound the nurses, astound the doctors. I pray faith would arise in Jesus' name. God, I pray for the body right now that you'll heal this joint issue, this knee issue, this hip issue. God, I pray you'll do that so our faith would grow. People will believe for the first time. And God, we declare today, we believe in miracles for today. We know you did it in our posture of worship as we give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God a hand for life change the Radiant Church. Aren't you grateful? <laughs> Sit down just for a minute if you would. We're not done yet. There's still one more miracle God wants to perform in this place today. And then we'll let you go. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Right now, this is the miracle of salvation. Somebody's going to get saved today. If you're going to raise your hand at home, put the emoji up. Our online pastors will pray for you. And here you're going to raise your hand in just a few minutes. But here's why God does miracles. The miracles you just saw that are going to happen have happened. They're going to happen on the way home today. It's going to happen tonight at the dinner table. It's going to happen in the morning when somebody wakes up. Those miracles are done, John chapter 20 says, so people will come to faith for the first time. So people will raise their hand and say, I want that kind of God in my life. I don't want to live life alone. Because God has made all of us with a God-shaped hole in our heart. And a lot of us try to put fame and fortune and fun in that hole, and it never works, does it? It's like a square peg in a round hole. And, and you try and you try, but your life is unfulfilled. At 31 years old, I gave my life to the Lord because I wanted fame, fortune, and fun to fill my life. And I realized there's a God-shaped hole called Jesus. And only Jesus can fill that hole. We're created in the, in the image of God to be in relationship with God here and into heaven. But there has to be a moment in time that everybody individually outside someone else's faith, not the faith of the person to the left, not the faith of the person on the right, there has to be a moment in time where you alone by yourself have declared, I need Jesus to be the Lord of my life in every area. If you've never done that, you're not saved. There's hell and there's heaven. There's no limbo. You're gonna go one place or the other. And you're gonna spend the rest of your life there. And after a person dies on the other side, you can't make a second decision. This is the moment, this is the day. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day of salvation. He brought you here, not by mistake. He knows your name. He knows your situation. And he knows your past, but the past is the past. The, the old can become new. And just because you're a nice person, doesn't take you to heaven. Just because you dropped a little money in that bucket or on the box, not going to go to heaven. Just because you served somewhere at this church, went to a second Saturday, it doesn't get you to heaven. Just because grandma prayed for you doesn't get you to heaven. Just because you were sprinkled as a kid doesn't get you to heaven. There has to be a time and a moment where you declare by faith, you stretch your faith and you stretch your arm towards the God in heaven and say, Jesus, I need you to be the Lord of my life in every area. Has has about an eyes closed, nobody looking. If that's you today. You want to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. I'd love to lead you in a prayer. All you have to do is pray the prayer I'm going to lead you in and you're going to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But today's your spiritual birthday. If you're here today, right now, and you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, just raise your hand all across this place today. Thank you. Thank you. When I see you, put it back down. Awesome. Thank you, whole family. Thank you. Praise God. That's powerful. Thank you. I see your hand over here. Praise the Lord. In the back, I see your hand. Online, raise your hand. This is the day. I see your hand in the back over here. Praise God. I see your hand on the front row over here in the middle. Thank you. 
Come on, saints, pray. There's one more person. Somebody hasn't raised their hand yet. God is telling me, don't quit. Thank you in the back row over here on the left-hand side. Praise the Lord. That's the name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. At home in person, if you raise your hand, pray something like this and believe with all your heart. Say something like this, Jesus, I love you. I ask you to forgive my sin. Forgive my sin of unbelief. Now believing I needed you to be my Savior. Because that changes right now. I do believe. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you're God Himself. And now I ask you to be the Lord of my life in every area. Never will be separated from you again. Thank you for loving me first. Thank you for saving me. Thank you that heaven's my new home. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God a life hand for life change already in church. Aren't you grateful? A dozen people are going to go see Jesus. The miracle of salvation. No greater miracle you'll ever see before your eyes is someone having a spiritual birthday. Praise the Lord. Thank you for praying this morning. Pastor Caden, I love you. Hope, oh, thank you for, when you're watching, thank you for having us today. I just want to say this to you that it's a privilege to be here. I love you. Connie loves you. Pastor Kate and Hope love you. More importantly, God loves you. Right? This is home. We're family. My prayer to you is that God would bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be super gracious to you. Make his face turn, turn, turn toward you and give you his peace in every area of your life. May you walk in the favor of God that lasts a lifetime. God is good all the time. All the time. Expect your miracle. God bless you.